Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program that I have the great privilege of hosting on Monday evenings, uh, which I have the privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their great love for Jesus Christ, followed him to a place they didn't, uh, didn't think about or maybe tried to stay quite away from, uh, and that is coming home to the Catholic Church. But really our discussion is not only about coming home to the Catholic Church, but really at the core of following Jesus faithfully wherever he would call. That's what this program is really all about. The journey home is following Jesus and following him faithfully. We believe he established a church, and that's why we're home. Now, you're an important part of this program. So even before I mention our guest, I want to give you the phone number because you're going to want to call tonight. It's 1-800-221-9460. If you're outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980. Our guest tonight is Karen Sadok. And our journey tonight is from primarily, most recently, the Anglican Church to the Catholic Church. But she also has a wider journey. She brought her first to the Anglican Church. And I do believe in hearing her story, you'll see that some of the reasons that drew her to the Anglican Church, on the one hand, drew her home to the Catholic Church, but also may have made it hard to make that final jump to the Catholic Church. It's often an issue that Anglicans particularly deal with. It wasn't quite the same for me as a Presbyterian, but I think I, I always love to hear the stories of Anglicans, especially given the issues that are facing Anglicans tonight. So if you're an Anglican watching tonight, an Episcopalian, you're more than welcome. We're glad you're here watching. And especially if you have a question, give us a call, 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980. And you can send me an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Karen, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you, Marcus. It's great to have you here. It's astonishing to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and as I mentioned, uh, the Anglican Church was not a step along my own journey. I was brought up Lutheran. I was... Congregationalist Presbyterian for a while, then the Catholic Church, and I stayed away from the Anglican Church. My experience with the Anglican Church was it was kind of way, kind of up there. I was more of a low church yeah, folk. Well. And so for my journey in the Catholic Church was a big jump from low church to high church, but yours was a little different. And so as I do every week, how about I invite you to start us at the beginning and give a bit of your spiritual background. Well, you're right, Marcus. By the time I came into the church, it was a change of one degree. <laughs> but it was everything. But I didn't start out anywhere near like one degree close to the Catholic <laughs> Church. I, I was raised in, a, in an unchurched, nominally Protestant family whose basic catechism was, we're not Catholic. <laughs> and uh, but. Yes, and my theological education began with, now I lay me down to sleep every night, which to me is, I think, a theologically perfectly sound prayer <laughs> and good for every little child to say. And I was taught the Lord's Prayer, and we uh, said grace at dinner. And that's more than most, though, I would say. Other than that, there was a, we never. My parents more never set many. foot in a church. Yep. And I went to Sunday school down the block. There was a Lutheran Sunday school because I didn't have to cross any streets, so I could go by myself. <laughs> and that was pretty much it um, until I was eight years old, and a little classmate friend of mine invited me to join her family spend the night with her and we went to the Bethesda Missionary Temple where uh -huh. I encountered the most amazing thing people jumped up from their seats and started wailing like banshees and I was scared to death <laughs> but my little friend Kathleen said don't worry it's only the Holy Spirit coming into them and it's perfectly fine and uh, then the, the the person who was doing the service that night invited all the sinners to come forward and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And sure enough, Kathleen and I went right up there with all the other sinners <laughs> and uh, gave our hearts to Jesus. And looking back, I don't doubt for a minute yeah. that I really did give my heart to Jesus that night. Yeah. Of course, I tried to take it back a couple of hundred times <laughs> subsequently, <laughs> but uh, he plays for keeps. Hmm. Not that he didn't let me think I was going my own way. So uh, after, after that, I can't say that I became a, a gung-ho Christian or, or anything of the kind, but um, there were little exposures because faith was in the culture at that time. Mm. All of my little, all my classmates were either mm. Catholic or Lutheran, mm. and they all went to church on Sunday. And uh, I went to an after-school program with Lutheran friends, and I learned the Apostles' Creed, and I learned this little light of mind and what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and. Uh, 
not much after that happened um, until high school when um, I was influenced by a thing called the Voice of Christian Youth. You ever hear of them? I don't think they exist anymore. They were a parachurch ministry, very evangelical, every standing up and making your witness, you know. So I started carrying a Bible around with my other books. <laughs> and uh, we used to meet in the radio broadcast studio at 7.30 in the morning and pray. We, we were very profound, you know. And Dear Lord, let the rally for Jesus be just terrific next week and, and help Al Alfred pass his biology test. We were very gifted. Yep. <laughs> Important stuff at that age. Is, yeah, yeah, at that yeah. age, you know. Indeed. But then there were. Then I was about about 16 years old, and and there were three heavy artillery mortars that mm -hmm. landed in my life that that made me wake up to the fact that there's more to this than voice of Christian youth, and you need to get serious. Yeah. And the first thing was that in my great books class, I read. Uh, the first book of the Divine Comedy, Dante's Inferno. And I, I know that it's you a lot of... You were blessed to have that option. Mm -hmm. You were blessed to have that option. So many people went through high school and college and never read the great classics, and well, you were blessed to have that I option. I was that very was, blessed to yeah. have that option. Yes. So it was very moving because it, it opened my eyes to a world that was comprehensively faithful, mm -hmm. despite all the chaos in the in the inferno I mean all these terrible people but it opened my eyes to the fact that you could view the secular world through the eyes of God as Dante clearly did and uh, I later ha carried a, uh, a second major in Italian in college just so I could read that book in, in Italian which I did in fact I met my husband because of that book um, the second thing that landed in my lap was a major exhibition at the Art Institute. I believe at, it was the single most comprehensive collection of 15th century Flemish primitive paintings ever assembled in one place. And these were works of the masters. The, these were Van Eyck's and Van der Weyden's and Van der Goes. I mean, the, the big names in Flemish painting. I had never seen anything like it. And my exposure to Catholic art was sort of pastel holy cards and sentimental Victorian uh, paintings and, re and religious art that was n not terrifically appealing mm -hmm. to a Protestant, but this was dynamic. This was passionate. This was deep, and the themes were all, nearly all religious, deeply Catholic. Um, the martyrdom of St. Lawrence and things like that, these huge themes, the themes of the passion, crucifixions, and. You, you, I couldn't take my eyes off it. I'm, I must have visited that exhibit not less than a dozen times. And the third thing, you know, it's always something <laughs> unimportant that, that gets you. And I wouldn't say it's so unimportant, but it, it really influenced me hugely. I went to the movies one night with my cousin who was visiting me in town, and we went to the movies. And um, the second film, not the film we went to see, but the second film that night was Fred Zinneman's 1959 classic, The Nun's Story. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I thought nuns were just for hitting little kids when they didn't know their times tables. I had no idea that this was a world that was people who were trying to live a pure gospel life with integrity and passion and to live a life of prayer and to make their prayer alive and Christ alive to other people. It, that was a whole new world for me. And the, I fell in love with the, the austere beauty of cloistered life as portrayed in that film. It was exquisite. And I would have signed up to be a nun right there on the spot, except <laughs> for the prerequisite that you had to be Catholic. So, and it never occurred to me, I was dense, you know, it never occurred to me that maybe this is a message mm. telling me that I should think about becoming Catholic, not a chance. Were you still basically at this time of the old, of the early ilk of your life? Pretty, yes, very much. I'm still in the voice no. of Christian okay. youth, you know. All right. So um, I realized, however, uh, this kind of uh, came, uh, stayed with me. And it made me realize that if people are living their lives as portrayed in, in that film, if the, f the faith 
of Christianity has intensity to it that can inspire a Dante and a van der Weyden, that this is something I need to deal with. Mm. And so I was um, English by extraction, and I had a natural proclivity to things English. I, I should backtrack a moment and say that one of the things that my mother did for me, she was uh, Canadian born but, but of English parents, was she insisted that I watch the coronation of Queen Elizabeth mm. when I was a child. And I fell in love with Westminster Abbey. <laughs> it's a magnificent place. Yeah. And yeah. I was also kind of haunted by an image that meant nothing to me, but it haunted me. Mm -hmm. And that is that in the coronation ceremony, after the queen receives her cr crown, she removes it before she receives the Blessed Sacrament. I didn't know what the Blessed Sacrament was. Mm -hmm. But if the queen is removing her crown to receive her king, this is something to pay attention to. <laughs> and if it's going to be religion, I want a piece of that. So I approached the Episcopal Church in my town. And um, I was very fortunate that it was the Episcopal Church. Because coming from where I came from, I was gradually admitted into a world that had three critical things. Real sacraments or a belief in the effic effica effic efficaciousness of sacraments. Yeah. It had a belief in apostolic succession and it had historic formal liturgy. And those are three really big things. Yeah. Definitely different than, than where you came from. Dif different from where <laughs> I came from. I also had a rector who had a very sensitive and strong ascetical and mystical bent. So those things meant a great deal to him. And since things that Catholics did were not acceptable, if Episcopalians did them, it's okay. Like we always tell a joke on ourselves about the 39 articles where it talks about the, um, the uh, Romish doctrine of purgatory and how it is repugnant to the word of God, right? Huh. But the Anglican doctrine of purgatory is okay. <laughs> so, so if Anglicans did it, it's okay. So that was a huge step for me because it drew me into living a life that was Catholic in form. Then I went to college. Oh. Now, how long were you Anglican then about up well, until the stage until you went to college? Or just I, I entered the, I started going to the Episcopal Church when I was 16. I was okay. confirmed when I was 17 All and right. went to college. Okay, so a couple of years, very active in the Anglican year, Church. A year and, and a half, and then right. I went to college. Went to college. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, maybe, uh, let's just jump right into what opened your heart because uh, I think we'll clarify just a couple of issues because I think I think you made a, a, an important point that this is a this often the conversion for people from Protestant to Catholic Church that's the big jump you're making that big jump at this point in time mm -hmm. into the Anglican Church because yes. really that was the big jump for you're you right. at that point right there and you're going through these couple years of that's what I was wondering about those couple years about there is the conversion process of dealing with doctrine praxis Price. morality and all those issues compared to more of a free evangelical perspective to a very I mean really really Catholic in almost all of its degrees yes, and that's so right. you went through that period right during that time as a young, young woman so you get to college and uh, very active then while you're in college oh, in the absolutely Anglican absolutely all right well then what grabs you and gets you thinking Catholic Palmer Throop Palmer legendary Thru. history professor at the University of Michigan, <laughs> a scion of one of the fine families of Virginia, characterized all of his favorite people in history, Plotinus, one of the great metaphysical brains of all time. We <laughs> loved him to death. And he, he made us read Irenaeus of Lyon, that famous yeah. defense of the Sea of Rome. Mm. And I'm sitting in the undergraduate library and I'm reading this and I'm thinking, whoa. He's right. So I went back to Canterbury Club and they said, well, right. And I said, pardon me? And they said, well, he's right. 
except, you know, the church has been split since 1054, so you can't accept this with the same authority that, that you would if the church had remained undivided. We don't have the consensus for papal infallibility and the things that go along with this oh. supremacy of the See of Rome. And I said, well, okay, so I didn't become Catholic that year. But that was, that was oh. the place where I knew probably I was going to have to die Catholic one way or the other. I thought the way it was going to be, many of us at that time thought that there would be union because so many Anglicans were were coming towards Rome. So we remained faithful in our Anglican tradition and those steps were looking better and better all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's how we thought it was going to be. Let me ask you this point. I mean, because when you talk about Anglicanism, especially American Anglicanism, Mm -hmm. I mean, the range. Oh, it's enormous. Of what you might experience at any local Episcopal church you walk into is just a huge range of, sadly, doctrine, practices, everything, liturgy. Uh, where were you at in that time? Were you Anglo-Catholic? Was I was in the middle. Okay. Irenaeus caused me to start up-churching. All right. you know, instead of becoming Catholic, I just kept up-churching one notch at a time. But this particular answer that you received to your question at this point then became your knee-jerk response, which protected you from actually acting on what he had convicted in your heart. A little bit, yeah. Because that's sadly like that. what often happens, yeah. is yeah. that we find something, you know, like for me it was, I believed in eternal security, but then there's Hebrews 6, 4 that says that if you've tasted it and leave, mm-hmm. you've committed apostasy. Well, someone would give me a quick answer to that, oh, good, I don't have to think about it anymore. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So there it is at the seed, but what happened? Well, it uh, stayed a seed for a long time, only this thing about religious life was still bothering me so after I graduated from college I worked as a while for a journalist and uh, I made a brief vocation retreat with a community that I found out Episcopalians have sisters I made a brief vocation retreat expecting to come away with a date for entrance and I found myself being pushed out the door like as if there was a hand on uh, on my back I couldn't wait to get out of there so that wasn't going to be for me. But while the plane was in the air, almost while the plane was in the air on the way home, the Episcopal Church was voting to admit women to the diaconate. Yeah. Now, I wasn't too quick. I didn't realize that this was ne- going to be a necessary uh, step to priesthood for women because I've become Catholic by now. So I know that ordaining women to the priesthood is going to be an impediment to union yeah. with Rome. But um, I decided that I would apply to seminary. Yeah. That was a godsend, and I did. And uh, meanwhile, a lovely man I met when I, we, I was a student at Oxford. Um, I, t- I told you Dante caused me to meet my husband. <laughs> I had written an essay on the on the Divine Comedy, and it won a contest at the University of Michigan Hopwood Award. That paid paid my way to Oxford to study 17th century um, oh, influences, uh, um, Italian influences on Milton, where I met this lovely Catholic boy from Brooklyn. Well, seven years later, he asked me to marry him, and he got a job in New York City, and I was headed for seminary, and it was like God was... he was, Catholic at the time? He, he had been Roman Catholic, yeah. and it was another gift to me that he had become um, an Episcopalian without my getting involved in that yeah. uh, through issues that had come up in his own life. So Jeffrey had made that choice, so we were happy little peas in a pod there. Okay. So really, I, in that sense, that didn't spur you on to Rome more, it just made you more content right where you were. Absolutely. And I'm, I have to say, when I hear stories of people and their journey into the church, that, that I have been blessed for virtually all of my marriage huh. to have that man Praise beside God. me Praise in God. the pew. What a gift. He is so there you were, happily married, with uh, happily in your church. Uh, you still got another boot. What brought you closer to the Catholic Church? After seminary, um, different th- different things happened. Um, I did not pursue the diaconate. That's a whole different story. I don't think I need to go into yeah, it here. Um, and I moved along. I, beca- I was drafted into the sort of the wing of the church that was trying to save the church from mm. itself as various uh, doctrinal and moral issues yeah. began collapsing one by one. Um, many, many Episcopalians with great courage and, and vigor and sincerity and effort tried very hard to staunch the, yeah. the bleeding and it, it didn't work. But there were little pieces that 
it's not just one thing. Right, right. It's little pieces. I, I remember I had made the acquaintance of Malachi Martin. Many people who watch this show may remember him. Yeah. And I remember he looked at me one day and he said, you're going to have to die Catholic, of course, or you go to hell. <laughs> and people get shocked when they hear that. I realized what he meant. Karen, you walk like a duck, you talk like a duck, you think like a duck. What are you? What are you doing? You know, what are you doing? It's a, you're living a lie, yeah. and uh, that was one of the little things that came in uh, to make me make the choice. Ultimately, what was the biggest final straw? You know, that you would say that would really kick the kick you in. Ultimately, what was it? The there were two things: little okay. sentences that came through prayer. Right. One was, if you have apostolic succession and Peter is not in your Episcopal college. What are you thinking? Hmm. Uh, that, that was the first thing. And the second thing also came in prayer. Hmm. And it was, Karen, you have come to the point where not to do this hmm. is sin. And I still still thought you don't I kept saying, Lord you can't want me to be a Catholic it's just going to be going through the same thing I've been through for the last 25 years only worse <laughs> the stakes are higher it'll be worse you know and he said um, yeah <laughs> I think there's a place yeah. where you have to accept that you, you're not doing this because it's what you want to do hmm. you are accepting him on his terms in his church, and he'll make it happen. And I, I, I just came to a place where I realized that it's going to hurt. There was a, Henry Nowen wrote a wonderful book called Reaching Out, and in that book, it's his way of describing the three movements of the spiritual life, and one of those he talks about the movement from loneliness to solitude. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and as I thought about your journey, and I thought about the maturing of your faith on that journey, it, it often seemed that that described to me what you were going through in uh, God making meaning and depth out of that loneliness that you had often felt in your own spiritual life to the real solitude and peacefulness with Christ. I mean, we didn't have the time for everything. We talked about your Ignatian retreat that you went on and the big impact of that. and. And I'm wondering about people who might be watching who struggle with that loneliness in their spiritual life. And I think you found a depth of it in the solitude of the Catholic faith. Can you talk a bit about that before we take a break? You know? uh, thank you for asking that, Marcus. It's very true. And I think that m many of us uh, think that in making these choices that we can do it, it's, it's going to be easy, or that because there are other people perhaps with us, mm -hmm that it'll be better. But ultimately, this, this journey is like death. Yeah. You, you do it on your own account. You will stand at the throne of God alone mm. at the Last Judgment. And, and this is a road you have to travel alone in response, personal response to the call of Christ. Mm. And no one can do it for you. And yeah. it has to be whole and entire. And the solitude is, is, is true. It, it is loneliness. I think people who expect this to happen without tears are misreading the road. It, it is a road of many, many tears. Yeah. And uh, Although your husband did, in fact, come back. He came back before, bef before you did. He That's did. Right. He came back before. And uh, just like he became an Episcopalian, never talked about it with me. He just... <laughs> quietly made his own choice, his own decision, didn't challenge me with it, and it, it wasn't a couple of years that I, fo I followed him. All right. I am very blessed. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's take a break, and we'll come back with your questions for Karen Sadak. Thank you for sharing it with us. See you in a bit.
Welcome back. Our guest is Karen Sadak, and thank you very much, Karen, for, you know, it's always, time flies, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you did a fine job, but let's jump. We've got a number of callers, so let's get right into our first caller, and Joel from Ohio. Hello, Joel, what's your question for us tonight? Hi, I want to know why you think there is really no real role for Mary in Protestantism, and especially since um, the fathers of the Protestant movement had strong devotion to Mary. Yeah. Why is it diminished? Great, Joel. Thank you for bringing that issue up because it's an important one. It's a wonderful question um, and I'm glad you asked it and I'm glad you know that the uh, founders of the Protestant movement had a devotion to Our Lady because they all did. Luther, Calvin, yeah. uh, Cranmer to their dying day believed all of the uh, the doctrines that Catholic Even Church... Even Cromwell? And, really? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think what happened is that the Enlightenment came along <clears throat> and I think Our Lady was um, I think she was trashed with the with the Enlightenment. It was a, a rationalist movement, and these are are doctrines that you have to accept in love and faith, yeah. and you have to take a little bit of a jump. And I think that's the, that's pretty much the answer. Yeah, it reminds me. You said in your early days that your main doctrine was anti-Catholic. Yeah, and that's really right. why people are are really pulling Mary out of their belief system. It's just and because it, it was that is Catholic. changing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully, maybe for example, Lutherans will rediscover the the Marian heritage in Luther, and Calvinists will discover the Marian heritage that's there in Calvin. You know. A New Zealand acquaintance of mine, an internet acquaintance, has just told me that there's a, a Marian festival and a statue of Our Lady travels from church to church in New Zealand. The church is named for Our Lady. Nearly all of them are Anglican churches, yeah. and uh, so it's. Yeah. Good. Coming. Good. Let's go to our first email. This is Brenda H. And she says, hello. I am a college student and as a result of one of my great books courses, Dante's Divine Comedy, Milton's Paradise Lost, and Augustine's Confessions, I immediately converted to Catholicism. However, my friends and family are convinced that I've been brainwashed by these books. How would you suggest responding to this? Thanks, Brenda. Great email. Oh, Brenda, you <laughs> have obviously sent, been sent to a very fine university. And if they want to call it brainwashing, you could say, well, what better brainwashing could there possibly be? These are wonderful, wonderful guides into the truth of the Catholic faith. And there's more to come. So That's right. hang in there. We love you. I mean, there's brainwashing and there's brainwashing. Yes. You know, like there's a lot of trash that our culture has put into our minds that, boy, I wish we could. Those of you who are computer folk, I wish I could defrag my brain. You know, <laughs> I wish I could defrag my metal hard drive and put it in order. And, uh, and, you know, in all the, the, the random files that we pick up in our life, well, brainwashing is a way of purging in that sense, good sense, uh, not a mindless thing. But as in your own life, right? I mean, the gift of being able to encourage you to read those books when you're young and formative. You know, I read Dante's Infernal two years ago for the first time. <sighs> <laughs> Thanks to Dorothy Sayers. Yeah, one of the great, the great things is learning to love God with your mind. And we live in a time when people want you to have feelings about everything. But um, Brenda, keep it up. That's right. God bless. Thank you for your witness. Let's go with Lee in Minnesota. Phone caller tonight. Hello, Lee. What's your question? Uh, wonderful show. Conversion seems to be a change of heart to which all people are called. And since so many people have abandoned penance or confession, and that is often cited as a barrier to conversion, what role did or does that have for you now? Thank you very much. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lee, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for calling in, and thank you for that very, very sensitive question. The, I don't know why people are abandoning it. I think it's because our culture is just so... Um, driven by the whim of the moment and the pleasure of the moment. But conversion is a true joy. Yeah. And penance within the framework of conversion means that you are drawing closer and closer to God. And when people are able to avail themselves of the sacrament of, con of confession, which is the most amazing gift of the church, um, it draws them closer to the heart of Jesus. Yeah. And I don't know anyone who has ever experienced the goodness of conversion, penance, confession, not necessarily in that order, who would not agree that they are steps into the heart of Christ. You know, uh, 
that there's a, in many things in Catholic Mass that are significant and wonderful, just beautiful. But there's one place in the Mass that I, I really like, particularly, and that's when the priest says, lift up your hearts. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that I used to always think of that as kind of a, you know, get happy, you know, lift up, get. But I've come to see that more as that's when we present our heart to God for examination. Beautiful. Because that's what life's all about, right? It's not when we get before Jesus and have you been a good engineer, a good truck driver, whatever it is. It's, well, let me see what your heart's like. How, how, how is your heart prepared, nurtured, torn apart in relationship to your call to be faithful where you are and what you're doing? Okay. And that's why conversion, we think about conversion in the Catholic Church. It's not merely jumping from this way of doing things to this way of doing things. It's here. Yeah, Conver conversion is an ongoing minute by minute, second by second, turning towards Christ. Yeah. And yeah. by necessity, turning away from other things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all the most challenging statements of Jesus about what it meant to be a disciple were always turning away from well, self and self demands to him. Well, what, were the, what was the first word out of his mouth when he came out of the desert? He said, repent. Yeah. That's an issue of turning. Let's go to this next email, Mark in Egan, Minnesota. Peace be to you. I love the show and has helped me greatly. I, I, thank you, Mark, for that uh, kind comment. My question is, when did you first learn of the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Also, what was your personal understanding of communion in the Episcopal Church? God bless you, Mark. Thank you. Wonderful questions. I can't tell you when I first learned of the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. When I became an Episcopalian, I was told that he is present. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, not, in, not in the ways that Catholics believed it, but the Episcopal Church has a breadth of permission in its faith. So when I finally came to the conclusion that it better be transubstantiation, they didn't throw me out. <laughs> so I can't say uh, when I first learned that. And what was the second part of that question, Marcus? Well, I think that was the main issue is, um, oh, well, I think uh, you were saying that in the Anglican Church there is this really yeah. Yeah. Uh, wide range, and I think you yeah. find that also in the Lutheran Church at times, that you can have the full range of how people understand that. So in a sense, you always um, understood it in that sense, so that wasn't really a major issue for you in the becoming Catholic, where it is for so many others. Yes. You know, and uh, I know some that because they came from traditions that didn't believe in anything more than the, mm then um, more, you know, as you would look at it from the, what, how you understand your senses only, you know, that mm -hmm. they end up praying for the rest of her life, I believe, but help my unbelief, you mm -hmm. know, help me grow in realizing the reality of that, which is true for many converts because of where they come from. You were more of the blessed side that that was something. I was very fortunate. Yeah. I encountered many wonderful people along the way. I mean, I don't, I don't want to press this too hard, but we, I mean, we don't believe the same between the two churches. Right. It isn't the same. It has to do with the issues of priesthood and other issues. But from a, your own pr preparatory yeah. perspective, yes. the Lord had prepared you yes. for that as not being a barrier for you. And thank God for that. Let's go to our next uh, email. Uh, it comes from Paul Graham in Denver. He says, Dear Marcus and Karen, when I recall some of my conversations with our Protestant brothers and sisters, I find the topic of accepting tradition with the scriptures to be difficult at times. I've had many of our Protestant Christians tell me in some form that, quote, all we need is the Bible alone. It doesn't matter which church preaches out of it. Karen, can you tell us how you approach the topics of tradition slash authority and the findings that led you into the Catholic Church? God bless you both. Paul, thank you very much for you. The issue of tradition and authority and the findings that led you to the Catholic Church. I, think I, have, to, I have to say that there are a lot of Episcopalians who think that tradition is our best thing, which it which it really is. But I think once you have accepted the idea that there is such a thing as apostolic succession, that Jesus spoke to Peter and to the Twelve and handed his faith on through those men, once you accept that, then you have to accept tradition. And there's no way around it. You have to come to terms with it. And you know the Greek Orthodox would say the same thing. The, the, the little linchpin that makes people nervous is always Peter. Yep. And for me, it came in that one sentence. Well, that's what sets a, a difference between tradition and tradition. With a capital T. There's lots of traditions out there, but which well, one? 
I, so, I would say that the Orthodox and Anglicans spell it with a capital T when they're talking about doctrine. Yeah, yeah, in the areas where they're definitely, there's yeah. very similarities. Yeah, we're not talking about how many bells you have on your thurible. Yeah, there's some push come to shove issues, <laughs> right? But I mean, there, <laughs> but on there, that's the beauty on the one hand of what unites us as Anglicans and Catholics. And we had really hoped that that would be yeah. drawing us to fulfilling jo John Paul's call for what I'm saying, you know, the one, yeah. you know. but sadly there are some areas that are making it even more difficult even as we speak. And so we do need to keep our Anglican brothers and sisters in our prayers and the struggles that they're going through worldwide on these issues. And it's not over yet. We know that from some, even watching the show, from letters I get from some of you, it isn't over yet. And so we need to pray for that, as well as other denominations that are dealing with those very issues this summer, maybe next year. We need to pray for them that they'll be faithful. Let's look at our next, uh, e uh, next phone call. This is Jim from Massachusetts. Hello, Jim, what's your question? Hi, Marcus. Hi, Karen. Oh, Bonitas, Karen. How are you? Jim Nutso? That's it. I <laughs> want, to, want to ask a question, Karen. When you moved from the Anglican, Anglo Catholic Church to the Roman Catholic Church, how was the tra transition in the liturgy to you? Well, Jim, <laughs> I know that you go to the Church of the Advent in Boston, and it is very, very painful for an Anglican who is accustomed to beauty and reverence and the honor of God and scholarly sermons, not, and not just homilies, and throw in a little palestrina. It's very, very tough for some of us to come over and experience the profound culture shock yeah. that you get when you walk into a Catholic church uh, in a normal suburb on a Sunday. And you know what? You have to stand it. Mm. You just, that's what it is. You want the authenticity? He didn't, you know, he doesn't make the church for me. He makes yeah. me for the church. I was just thinking about the, the gospel text for yesterday. Jesus said something about where your treasure is. Absolutely. And so we've got to make sure that our priorities are right. Mm. And there are certainly some things that can become huge, or as my younger son would say, huge barriers yeah. because they're so attractive and appealing and connecting and grasping. And there's so much in, in the Anglican liturgical tradition that is more of what a person who understands history uh, knows is, in fact, Catholic tradition. So that when we come into a, a Catholic church today, and what we see looks to us very Protestant. The kind of music yeah. that's being sung is more praise music or what I call devotional music, Christian yeah. cabaret, campfire music. Yeah. And the, uh, the majesty and the beauty of, of the tradition of yeah. Catholic worship is very frequently missing. It's very, yeah. it's very hard for us to, to leave it, and we do, with, we do it Th anyway. <laughs> this is one of those areas in Vatican II document on ecumenism. Um, the, the, the Council Fathers made a very significant statement, which I th I think it sounds a little intimidating to you Catholics out there, but I think there's great wisdom in it. Uh, it says that whatever the Holy Spirit has engraced in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. The point being that there are not everything, we don't just want to go out there as sadly what's been done is that stuff has been pulled in from these yeah. other traditions and brought in. We've got to be very discerning. However, there are some things like what you, the, the depth the depth of worship in the Anglican Communion that we can glean and learn from. Well, I think actually because the Catholic Church invented it. Yes, I think exactly. What, it's preserved that. Yeah, it's preserved there. Yes. And what we, what I see and what many people see is sort of the uh, incursion of secular models in, yep. in, in Catholic worship, which is really frightening to us. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I will say that for many of us, Protestant pastors that came in, when we see some of these changes in the Catholic Church that you've mentioned, we want to scream because that's what we saw happening. That was, oh, was you saw that. <laughs> we saw that happening in the liberal Protestant churches or going in these things. Is that that's not what we want to bring in. Mm -hmm. That's not that. But there are some 
good things that the Spirit is doing in, our, in the lives of our separated brethren that we're preserving yeah. certain aspects that we say that, yes, that's what we need to recapture. That singing, the great reverence. Mm -hmm. That's you know, I do find that in Catholic churches, but they're just not everywhere. Uh, we wish to be more. Certainly often. find it here. Yes, we, here at EWTN <laughs> is one of the great places we do find it, and uh, thank God for that. Let's go with our um, this email really quickly. Diana Williams in Queensland, Australia. Hello, Diana. Thank you for the email. Dear Karen and Marcus, thank you for sharing your story. I would like to ask you about women looking to go into the Anglican priesthood. It is my thought. Even as I speak, hopefully I'll keep talking. Uh, we have had a storm go by, and I don't know if I'm still being broadcasting at this point. Am I? I'm still talking? Okay, I can just barely, the email has come back on. Let's go. It is my thought that those women who are obviously very sincere in their desire to follow Christ could be misinterpreting their call. Could they really be attracted to the life of a Catholic nun, but don't understand the path to tread to fulfill their desire? Do you ever get the chance to speak to women about their choice to be priests? Thank you again, and may God bless you and your husband for being open to his voice, Diane Williams in Australia. Thank you very much. That's a big question. You've got an hour? <laughs> Early on when I was studying for, for the diaconate, I had thought that the uh, movement of women who were interested in becoming priests was had been um, inspired by the Holy Spirit drawing women to lives of service. I became quickly disabused of that and it was not hidden in the Episcopal Church. It was not hidden that this was a secular agenda and it was aimed at uh, issues of empowerment and it was very tangentially using, uh, the, chur using the church as a way of doing it. And uh, that does not say that every woman who's a priest in the Episcopal Church has that motivation because I've met a, a few who are wonderful, wonderful, holy women. Yeah. Um, and that's true, but the movement itself, and mind you, I'm out of it for a while, but in the early days, it was strictly uh, secular in origin and aimed at, uh, to quote one of those women, power and perks. Yeah. When I was in seminary, there were Catholic women mm -hmm. at my evangelical seminary getting MDivs, mm -hmm. hopefully that the door would open for right, them. Right, right. And they were always in your face yeah. on all these issues. And as for monastic life, it's hard to say because it's such a spectrum of what monastic life is in the Catholic Church or religious life in general, the active apostolic orders. It's a very different thing from priesthood. And for those who have a sense of what priesthood is. It's, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go with uh, our next caller, Charles from New York. Hello, Charles, what's your call, your question? How you doing, uh, yeah. Karen and Marcus? Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, tonight, uh, being brought up or uh, born in a Christian family, a Catholic uh, sect, and then uh, falling away from the actual religion at the age of 20, and yeah. being in Nowheresville, in like limbo for 30 years and then like last year 50 and when I reached 50 it struck me again like what I was doing uh -huh. and I started watching your channel and you know getting back into the faith and I feel like that my faith has been enhanced 10 times fold since I've been back into the religion but question is is that con uh, really considered a conversion coming back to the faith no. Yeah, thank you. We often will use the phrase revert instead of convert, but really it's a conversion. Talk about Absolutely it. Absolutely it is. <laughs> and every minute of your life, Charles, you are being called to conversion. Yeah. And if the Holy Spirit has given you this flood of grace, which he sometimes does, and it is an enormous gift, just thank him for it and fly on those holy wings and enjoy every second of it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when my boys and I were at a beach not long ago with these huge 13 huge waves you know and you know we're, we're, we're going in this direction and the next second we're going in the other direction because this huge wave has hit us well every day the battles there and at the minute we presume we've arrived the waves start hitting us uh, and so we talk about revert in this program because we specifically want to recognize that it was a person who was Catholic baptized turned completely away either to no faith at all or to an act of faith somewhere else, but then has come back. 
but in the reality, that was a conversion. And we all need yeah. one. Yeah, definitely. Every Catholic needs to be a conversion. And I didn't say that. I think Fulton Sheen said that. I think uh, John Hart, Father John Harden said that. I mean, Mother Angelica said that many times. Every Christian. Every Christian. I mean, the person who has the Catholic. flood of a born again experience, that's a wonderful thing. You can't stop there. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Let's see if we can grab this last email we take our final break. It comes from April in New York City. Greetings, Marcus and Karen. I love watching Journey Home, and I am delighted to hear how people have found their way back home. I am also a Catholic, formerly a Baptist. I am interested to know, Karen, how did your non-Catholic family take your conversion to the Catholic faith? Thank you. I have a very small family, and my parents are both dead, and I really didn't tell anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so it really hasn't been an issue. I mean, they yeah. really don't care what I <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's, in our work in the Coming Home Network, we're often answering this question for people, what do they do? In fact, it was with pastors, what do they do with their churches and all that? Oh, and usually we that's say, tough. yeah, usually we say, you need to discern and take the temperature of your congregation and their needs, will they understand, do they have enough information? There are a variety of, of ways to approach that. There's no one silver bullet each family is a little different. We would love to, you know, bring everybody home with us, but it's not always the case because mm -hmm. they're at different places in their spiritual journey. So, the, of course, the, always the issue is keeping them in prayer and never, ever stopping the love that we share yeah. with them, even when they don't understand. So, all right, thanks, Karen. Let's take a, a break. We'll be back just a moment with some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. Our guest tonight has been Karen Sadock. And how about as a kind of a bookend to our discussion, talking with the audience about how becoming a Catholic has deepened your faith in Christ? I don't know if you would call it deepening my faith in Christ, but there's one word, the peace. Hmm. For me, it was a, a years-long struggle. And when I finally said, Lord, I surrender, the peace. It was like an embrace, one degree, and it's everything. I remember the pastor that, that uh, was so influential in my coming back to Christian faith when mm -hmm. I, after I had gone way off left field during college, and when I was then, after my conversion, was needing to make some difficult decisions with my life, his statement was measure the peace. In other words, sometimes measure the peace because you see that as a gift, as the fulfillment. When you have to make a different, you live with a decision for a couple days and you live with its alternate and try and somehow, under the guidance of the Spirit, measure that peace, understand that peace, as a sign of God saying, I, you're on the right track. It's not always easy there, no. but it's a confirmation. Of course, there's also that statement by Jesus in John 15 about, hey guys, the reason I'm telling you all this stuff is so you might have my joy in the fullness of that. That's Would you say that you've experienced, I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but mm -hmm. you've found a more fulfilling aspect of that joy in the Catholic Church, even though some of the music isn't quite what you were used to, but. No, it's, uh, joy is a, is a very misunderstood word in our culture, and it is not always hysterical elation. Yeah. And it, joy is often a flood of tears. And actually, in our tradition, tears are called a gift. And yeah. it, it is a gift. It, it, measure the peace, what a wonderful thing to say. <laughs> measure the peace, that is such a gift. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that is a joy. Well, Karen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, us. Marcus. Thank you for sharing it's your been story. A opening up to the audience. And uh, I know they appreciate your willingness to share what God's done in your life and bring you home to the Catholic Church. I thank you for joining us. You know, a couple things that, that uh, 
it came up in tonight's program that I think are important. And as I say this, I, I'm a little hesitant because I'm afraid that maybe some uh, of Catholics might misunderstand what I'm saying when I, when I emphasize the fact that John Paul in his encyclical Redemptoris Missio, I wish I had the entire text in front of me, but he says in that encyclical that converts are a gift to the church. And he elaborates on that. But one of the things he mentions and emphasizes is that, that we can learn from our converts. We're all, we're all called to be converts. But often we recognize, as I mentioned earlier in that uh, encyclical on uh, ecumenism, that sometimes we can see that the Holy Spirit is able to do things out there in ways that he would like to do in here, but maybe because we're so set in our ways or, we, you know, that we can learn. Now, not everything. That's why we, when we look for renewal and we look for ideas, we've got to make sure that we're doing it in union with Peter in the hierarchy. We don't just grab something and pull it in. And, and I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of things I've seen pulled into the church that I wish had never been pulled in. But when I think about what Anglicans have to give us, I think that they preserve some aspects of the reverence in worship and singing. That is something we need to, to glean a little bit. Um, in our singing, it isn't just make a joyful noise. It's, it's really let it go from our heart, the joy and the gifts that we've received in this wonderful church. Why do we hold back at all? Why do we hold back to let, to let the world not hear the beauty and graces of this church that we've been given. Let's let the world know through every aspect of our worship when we stand before him in great praise. We'll talk more about that later. God bless you. It's always a pleasure to be with you on the journey home. See you next week.